Hello, everyone. I'm really, really excited you're here today on Vegetarians and Meat Lovers podcast. Welcome to my podcast, where we talk about all things related to food and cooking, vegetarians and meat lovers, because I am a vegetarian in a meat eating family. So I have to cook meals that fit both types of food. And today my guest is Mary Audette White. Now, did I say your name right? Exactly. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. And I'm so excited to talk with her. She is amazing. She's really amazing. With a 40-year focus on the importance of family and a passion for Southern comfort food, Mary Audette White is an expert in melding the two together effortlessly. Mary is a New York Times bestselling author with 10 cookbooks under her belt, and her recipes have been featured in Good Housekeeping, Country Living, Today, House Beautiful, Texas Living, Food and Wine, and many more. Her website is therestlesschipotle.com. On Facebook, she is also Restless Chipotle. And you can sign up for her email list, which I'll put all these links down in the podcast show notes so everybody can find them as well. But that's at restlesschipotle.com backslash subscribed backslash. And we're going to have in the podcast show notes also a crockpot smothered chicken recipe that Mary has shared with us. Thank you for sharing that and welcome to my podcast. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. You have quite the career. Now, tell me how you got started in all of this, because I mean, that's a that's a quite a feat to have 10 cookbooks. That is just awesome. Okay. Well, several of those were ghostwritten for companies, so my name's not on them, but I still take credit for them because I wrote them. Um, they were they were just somebody asked me if I wanted to do it, and I said sure. And I didn't know any better that you know it was hard work, and I thought <laughs> sure, I can write a cookbook. Why not? And so that's what I did. One that you can find on Amazon is Mexican Slow Cooker Cookbook, and that one is under my name. And then I did a Cookies and Brownies Cookbook like century ago, and that one is also under my name. And then there's a few more, but I can't remember what they are right now. I have it written down. Bread Boot Camp and Effortless Summer Entertaining for the Rest of Us, right? Does that sound right? Yeah. <laughs> Very awesome. So people can put your name in Amazon and find those books. And I'll, I'll put as many of the links down in the podcast show notes that I can. So people could just get right through to those. But yeah, they are a lot of work, aren't they? They are. <laughs> I really had only been blogging for a couple of, well, it was a couple of years, but it was more hobby blogging at that point. That was in like 2005. And a what are they called? Those people, an agent. Publisher? Oh, an agent. Agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agent came to me and said, hey, would you like to write a cookbook about cookies? I like your recipes. I said, sure, mm. why not? That would be fun. <laughs> yeah, yes. sure. So that was the first one. <laughs> and that was an experience. And then I did several more, more after that. So that's awesome. And so how long have you been running your blog? Under its current name in since 2009. Prior um, to what I started about 2005. Okay. So I've been around like a long time. <laughs> You've seen a lot of changes across the internet, social media and all of that because it's changing it. so rapidly, right? It is, but it's always changed rapidly, I think. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. we used to just post recipes without pictures and um, did not have social media to, you know, so we would just go to each other's blogs and share. We didn't make money. It was just kind of what we did. Sure. Right. That's amazing. And what got you into it? Like what, what was your thought process? Like, Hey, I want to share or just wanted to present things to the world. What was your thought process? My two oldest kids had were adults and they had moved away from home. My daughter had moved out of state with her family and my oldest son had joined the military and he was in Japan and they were constantly emailing me and stuff. Mom, how do you make blah, blah, blah? And I would, so I, I'm just going to start a blog. I'll put all the recipes on there. You guys can follow them. And that way I'm not getting all of these texts and emails and not that I, <laughs> not that I mind talking to them, but it was like, so yeah. That's really cool. So it basically started as a family communication and it's turned into yep. this. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. It is. I feel very blessed. We, Currently, we're getting over a million page views a month. So that's awesome. Yeah, that I can't fantastic. believe it. 
<laughs> it's really hard to wrap your your mind around sometimes. It really is. So like the podcast or the not podcast, the the website you have now, did you move things from your old podcast or did you start fresh with the new Chipotle, Restless Chipotle one? Um, or did you pull it from my, your old one? Some of them I pulled from the old site and mm-hmm. and then some of them over the years it's been like, oh, I'm not keeping that on site. Because your lifestyle <laughs> changes, right? Mm-hmm. When I first started blogging, I was I had small kids, I was yep. homeschooling, I was we had goats and chickens and all, you know, I, I did a vegetable uh-huh. and, and I was like, everything has to be organic and you should use goat <laughs> milk and you know, all of the things. And now I'm like, so you open up a can of cream of chicken soup, you know. <laughs> yeah. So some some of the things that were just too too snobby about certain kinds of foods I had Mm. to get rid of so that nobody would be laughing at me about it. (laughs) I totally get that. And also, I think what changes through time of being a parent is what your children eat. Because you talked to me, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was nobody eating salad in my house. And now they want salad, right? Like what they eat changes. And I feel like that also impacts what I'm making because now they eat so many different things that I have so much more freedom when I'm cooking. Yeah. At least my children well, started out picky and got less picky as age went along. And that happens. A lot of mine was, you know, when I first started, I have eight kids. I had six, right. you know, and so my youngest is going to turn 20 on Saturday. And oh, so yes. how I cooked for eight kids and how I cook, mm-hmm. you know, with, I've still got four kids at home, but <laughs> You know, how I cook for six adults at home is very yes. different. Oh, totally. I'm going through that too because my three boys are all three teenagers. And yeah, it's like basically we're feeding five adults. We have three boys and then my husband. So yeah, feeding five adults is a lot you, different than if you feeding have children. Three boys, if you have three boys that are teenagers, you're feeding more than five adults. They count for <laughs> You're <two> right. <laughs> That's very true. I'll go to the store and I'll buy all this food and I'll be like, this is going to last a really long time. And it just doesn't. No, my youngest son is a personal trainer and a bodybuilder. Uh, Yes. So we go through a lot, a lot of chicken breast at my house. And I'm like, really? You know, we (laughs) just bought 10 pounds three days ago. So... I said that because my oldest also does do bodybuilding and weightlifting. So and he's very specific. He wants a lot of protein mm-hmm. and he wants vegetables and fruits. So yeah, I totally can understand where you're coming from with that one. And he's 19. So he's my oldest. It's first year, just finished his first year in college. So awesome. amazing for you. Yeah. Amazing for you to also like be able to get these cookbooks done and blogging with children. I mean, that's a huge challenge, right? I mean, it really no, just it is. I, I am very lucky in that I do not require a lot of sleep. I have never required <laughs> a lot of sleep. And so if I, I can work 20 hours a day for an extended period of time without there being a problem and it's what did it, I would wait till the kids went to bed and then I would just, you know, I'd divide the number of recipes that was required by the number of days mm. I had to do it. And then, okay, I have to do 10 recipes a day. I have to do, you know, I have to write down oh. 15 recipes a day or whatever. Yeah. That's a lot, but you're kind of like me. I don't require a lot of sleep either, but thinking of doing 10 recipes in a day blows up my brain. I generally do. I don't do as much as you do, but I do like one, you know, like, cause it, you know, taking pictures too is quite a challenge. I mean, obviously you had to learn photography as well, which I've had to do yeah. Also, and that's a feat in itself. Yes, it is. I didn't have to do photography for the cookbooks. So there was mm, that. And that's... it was also easy in that a lot of the recipes that they asked for were recipes that I had been making for years. So sure. I knew they worked. And, you know, and so there was that. That made it a whole lot easier. It's not like I was triple testing recipes and things. Like that. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you. Like for your cookbooks, do you have a certain number of times you make it before you say, okay, this is it? Or is it based on how it tastes? So like, is it always the same? Do you have a standard or is it very? It varies. If I'm doing a recipe for something that I've been making for 40 years, I am not probably going to test it a whole lot before I do it and put it on. But if it's a relatively new recipe, I usually try to, uh, to test it at least four or five times just to make sure that it's pretty similar each time. The first time I have to figure out how to measure because I, I don't measure 
if I'm just cooking for us, I don't use measuring things. Yep. So it makes it much more difficult when it comes to writing the recipe if I don't. Instacart, groceries delivered in as little as one hour. Free delivery on your first order, $35. Save yourself that trip to the market. Instacart delivers groceries in as fast as one hour. They connect you with personal shoppers in your area to shop and deliver groceries from your favorite stores. Free delivery on your very first order, over $35. Following the link in the show notes lets Instacart know we sent you and help support our show. Multiple stores available. Shop all of your favorites on a single order. The products you love from your local stores. Hand selected by shoppers based on your preferences. Delivery to your door in as fast as one hour. Instacart highlights deals to help you save money. Don't we all want that? Find everything you usually buy and get smart suggestions for new items. Instacart picks the freshest produce and keeps your eggs safe too. Woohoo! Those are things I want. Try it out today. You will love it. I understand that too because my grandma was like that and I learned some cooking from my my mom and my grandma. My grandma was like that. She's like, you just do this, you just do that. And it wasn't exact, you know, it wasn't this exact thing. So it is something to learn and pay attention to. Okay. I need to tell people this is one cup in one third cup. Like you have to be exact. Yeah, absolutely. It's a different way to cook. It is mm-hmm. totally different. Plus a lot of times I adapt rest. I have probably close to a hundred old cookbooks from like oh, 1880 wow. to about 1980. And okay. so I take recipes out of those and adapt them. But the one thing people don't understand is even 50 years ago, flour was different. You know, certain, yes. my mom, my fudge recipe that is on my blog is my mom's recipe. And when I read her recipe the first time, when I was getting ready to put on the blog, it said, start with a five cent Hershey bar. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> cause I'm not even sure you can get a little edge with that. Right. So, yeah, right. so everything is different. And when you're adapting those old recipes, you have to be really, really careful. That's really cool. And that's actually like me too. Like I have all of my mom's old cookbooks. So like I have the cookbook book from my grandma's family, like from their church in South Dakota. Like I have my mom's 1960s barbecue. I mean, when you look at it, you can tell just by the pictures. I mean, this is from the 1960s. And I love to do that too. And as well as taking my mom and grandma's recipes too. I don't have like a ton of them, but I like to have my mom's old recipe cards Mm -hmm. in her handwriting and my grandma too. And they're just really, it's just, it's really special to have, but you're right. You do sometimes have to modify those, which you wouldn't expect, but you do. You do. Because even the texture of the flour is different than it used to be. So if you're doing a cake recipe and it says two cups of flour, you might need two and a half cups, or you might need one and three fourths cups. It's, it just, it's crazy. Right. And I think the region is different too. Like when I look at the cookbook from South Dakota, it's very different. There's so many, I mean, we have a lot of hot dishes in Minnesota too, you know, casseroles, people call them casseroles, but we call them hot dishes a lot, but they are different than if you're going to look at foods from where you are or the East coast or California. And it's kind of mind blowing to think how many different types of foods we have, culture foods or foods of cultures around the country. That's true. And I was worried for a while in the eighties that they were going to all start melding together because there were so many chain restaurants and they were all the same and everybody was doing the same kind of cooking and you know but I think in the past 10 years probably in the past 10 years we've kind of gone the other way and people are more interested in their culture their cultural cooking and you know their different things like that. Oh, absolutely. And so have you always been in Texas? And so you kind of cook with that type of Texan flavor or have you been other places and has it impacted your cooking? I've been other places. Uh, My ex-husband was in the military and we traveled quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So, but I have been in Texas, let's see, I'm 63. And so I've been in Texas at, if you put it all together, at least 55 of those 63 years. Okay. So, yeah. I think you're very influenced. <laughs> it's my influence. My mom was from Michigan. And so I do have a little bit of that influence in, the, you know, the more Midwestern kind of stuff and some of the things, but for the most part, it's pretty Texan. 
Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. And I love your title of your pot or your, I keep calling you a podcast, but <laughs> your website, how did you come up with that name? It just happened. I was like back when, again, way back then we, um, nobody was really worrying about having a keyword in the name. Okay. Sure. There were there was no such thing as keywords. Yeah. So you just wanted something that was memorable. And I was like, okay, what's memorable? What's memorable? And I was like, looked over and I had some Chipotle's on the counter that I was working with. <laughs> Chipotle, Chipotle. And my one of my kids came in and said, Mom, why are you so restless right now? Because I ha- I do have ADD, but I mm-hmm. around the, and I was thinking, I was like, what else? What else? And so that's how it happened. <laughs> that's a fun story. And I totally get it. Sometimes that's just how things happen. They just poof, yeah. you know, and it's just the right timing. And that's very cool. And so what are your favorite things to cook with? And do you like to cook more entrees or desserts, breakfasts, casseroles? What are your favorites? I am absolutely a bread person. I learned how to make bread when I was 14. And so I've been making bread a very long time. I love making bread and, but not that many people want bread recipes. So I, you know, you have to make what people want to come see. And so myself, I love making bread. I love making desserts. The, The baking aspect of it is my favorite, but I just like all of it. I just like to cook. I like to make things taste really good. I like to really, I don't know about you, but I like to try unusual things together too. You know, like things that you wouldn't normally have together. I think that's really fun to experiment with. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so do you think people don't like bread because they're trying to stay away from carbs or why do you think people don't like bread? No, I think people don't have time to make bread. Yeah. Yeah. I get get what you're saying. Or I've got some batter bread recipes that are very quick, but for the Mm. most part, when somebody comes home from work at night, they are not wanting a loaf of bread and they have Sunday afternoon off most of the time, unless they really love to cook, they are not wanting to spend it making a loaf of bread. So I have it on the blog for people who want it, but I don't do hundreds of breads. You know, that's not what it's about because there's just, there's just not that many people that want those recipes. Right. And and the other thing I think too, is there's so many amazing bakeries out there that make it. So it's just so easy to just pick it up and be like, I mean, you have to, yeah, you have to enjoy the process of it. And there's some people that do, and there's some people that don't. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So did you find it a challenge feeding, talking about feeding children, to have them all having different tastes and different things they liked, or do they just have to eat what they, what you put out? How did you go about with your parenting and feeding kids? (laughs) I'm pretty, I'm pretty laid back sort of parent, I guess, but Mm -hmm. The deal was you could eat what was on the table. You had to take one bite. If you didn't like, I wasn't going to push it. Nobody had to clean their plate. And if there was absolutely nothing on the table you liked, you could make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what I did too. I was very, I never wanted to force my kids to eat their whole plate because I didn't want them to overeat and get used to overeating and then lead to obesity and all of that. I know so many parents do that. And then I get not wanting to waste food, but you don't want to make them feel like they have to eat when they're full. Yeah. And really with kids, you've got to pick your battles. Yes. (laughs) I totally get that. What's one recipe your kids absolutely have loved though, that you just, that they remember from childhood and they're like, they want to make it over and over again. This is really funny because it's absolutely not on the blog, but I was going to ask you, and is it on the blog? (laughs) You know, American goulash, my mom used to make it. Oh yeah. My mom did too. So there was, there's that, that I have to make on a regular basis for my kids and my mom's potato soup recipe, which is on the blog. Okay. And uh, my mom's chili, which isn't Texas chili. It's more of a Midwestern chili soup. I think that it is called. It's sure. like stewed tomatoes, very fresh tomato flavor and kidney beans and hamburger and green peppers and onions and macaroni. Oh, so, and macaroni. And okay. macaroni. And so if you tried to serve that to a real Texas person, they <laughs> would slap your hand. But 
addicted to it because my mom made it. And when your mom or your grandma makes something on a regular basis, you know, yes. so we have a tradition that the first cold day of the year, I always mm. that. And that's what we have for dinner. Cause that's what my mom used to do when it was really cold. The first cold day of the year, she would call and she would say, I made chili. Do you guys want to come over? And we'd be like, we'll be there in 10 minutes. You know, <laughs> isn't that so true? There's so much memories and foods in, in sure. dishes. I mean, it's just amazing. Even my, I see that in my kids too. And sometimes it's just really fun to see them react to that and be like, are you going to make this again? Are you going to make that again? You know, and like, it's just really fun to see that we all care about food, but there's so many memories in it too. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a big part of it. And I think it's funny, but when you lose someone like your mom or your dad, you yeah. know, you never, you can never fix the food the same way. It never tastes the same right. no matter what you do. It just doesn't. So mm -hmm. I told my kids to enjoy while they could, because the flavors were going to change when they started <laughs> making them. I know it's so true. Like I think of my grandma and she, she, you know, she was one of these people that lived through the great depression. So she was very, very frugal, but even being, you know, someone who always didn't have a lot of ingredients, she made everything taste amazing. Like she probably is the best food I've ever eaten in my life. Like she made the best food I've ever eaten in my life. Like you just can't duplicate it. And I don't know. She just had this talent. You know, she started cooking in eighth grade because they lived in South Dakota and their, the parents were out in the field. So she kind of became the mom and she was the cook. And so she started cooking in eighth grade, you know, so she learned through being thrown into the fire of, of making food for a full family. There were five siblings. So right. yeah. But yeah, no, we can't, you can't duplicate it. <laughs> nope, no duplicating it. It's so interesting. It's almost like there's magic in the food, you know, like you have the same recipe, but what is it that's different? Yep. Who knows? <laughs> there's something anyway, but it's just amazing. So what has been your most surprising thing in your journey to where you are today with all of this, the blog and your YouTube channel and your cookbooks and your success? Uh, I uh, was in a very difficult relationship prior to my divorce and sure. I came out of that. Uh, I didn't, I didn't have a job outside the house. We homeschooled and, you know, it, it was the whole, it was a very classic atomic kind of family, you know, the mm -hmm. husband and the wife and all the, everybody had their roles. Yep. And when he left because he had found someone else I had six kids at home and mm. I hadn't worked since 1981 oh, wow. and it was 2009 and that's a mm. big space of time. That is. And I came out of that feeling like I was trash, you know, yeah, I, right. I didn't have anything to offer anyone. I didn't have any abilities. I had this little hobby blog that I was doing, but that was nothing. You know, that was right, nothing. Right. So when I look and like my ex-husband didn't make a lot of money, we, to be honest, we dumpster dive sometimes to sure. put food on the table. Me and the kids did. And it sounds terrible, but you know, you do what you have to do. You have to survive. Yeah. You have to survive. So when I look back at that, those times, and then I look now, for example, in January, my husband, my current husband and I flew down to Buenos Aires and got on a ship and we went to Antarctica and Falkland Island and we did all of these things. Um, and I coach other bloggers Oh, nice! and stuff like that. And so people like some people actually look up to me and the idea oh, of yes. people looking up to me is I, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around. It's hard for me to go to the grocery store and buy whatever I want without having to worry about what the price is. So I guess right. that's the biggest change is just how much I've grown from it. Yeah. I've been at conferences, which is something the me, you know, 20 years ago would never have done. You know, right. Never. And right. I've spoken at conferences. I've, uh, I've been, a coach. I've, I've been in book signings. I've, you know, I've traveled all over the world, all of these things that that me would never have imagined me being able to do. That is absolutely phenomenal. And that is so moving to listen to what an amazing journey you've been on. And to go from that to this is just, it's, it's, wow. it, it is, it's a huge blessing. I, I am so grateful.
so great. That is awesome. That is so awesome. I love to hear that kind of story to hear where you came from a place, not only that was financially hard, but, you know, just, yeah, having the confidence to be like, okay, now I need to do something. And I haven't done anything like this in years. And I have all these children that I have. I mean, that's daunting. It was scary. My ex-husband didn't pay child support. So oh, yeah, so it was, it was really scary. It, you know, when you're, you're those first couple of weeks, um, Mm. it was like, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? The kids had always been homeschooled. So I don't want to put them in school because I felt like that would be much of a, you know, a change for them. They were already going through so much change. And then just, I just kept trying to find writing jobs online. And I would, Mm. at one point I was writing 80 articles a month for other (laughs) websites. And um, it's amazing. And and then working on my blog when I was done in the evening. So, you know, I've had a couple of people say, it's so easy for you, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you hit success so easily. And I'm like, well, most of the time, (laughs) if somebody is really successful, they've been working at it really, really hard. Right. And you obviously learned how to work very quickly and efficiently and write really well, really fast. So you, you learned skills. It wasn't just like you got lucky. You, you worked at it. Yeah. Actually having to write for all of those different websites was such a huge blessing. Not at the time because I really hated it and I was tired, but, but because I wrote for all of those different people and the way that they wanted things to write, you know, that was before SEO or it was right when SEO was getting started. And so I learned a lot from writing for different companies. I learned what worked. I weren't learned what didn't work. I learned what my voice was, you know, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard other people who've done writing for other people and or other companies or whatever. And they do, they think that you almost find your voice a little bit better because you're, you're learning to write in a different way and then it helps you realize that when you do it for yourself, it's, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. What a journey you've been on and what a great amount of content. Like, do you ever look back at it and be like, wow, I did all that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's only when I'm having to like do updates and work on it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> when you do so many things and you have to like send out an email and like, yeah, there's so many things to add. And you're like, wow, I really did a lot. Yeah. I really did a lot. Yeah. There's close to a thousand recipes on my blog. And wow. honestly, I have deleted probably five or 600 over the years. Oh, wow. And now why do you delete them? You know, some of them were, as I said, just so ridiculous. Like there's not a lot of people that want fresh goat milk ice cream or oh, okay, how to make gotcha. ricotta cheese. It was more of a homesteading like thing. And a lot mm. of those, that's just not the direction I went, you know, right. that, that's, that. Yeah. So it's kind of more like you were changing the focus of your entire blog. Yeah. So those just didn't like fit in anymore. And a lot of the stuff was just, again, it was just different from, you know, that was, gosh, it's over 10 years ago. And, you know, our eating habits and what we like and how we eat has changed so much in 10 years anyway. I just, mm-hmm. some of the things are fun to see on the blog from a long time ago, I've still got a few things from like 2006 and 2007. Some of it was just not appropriate for who I am now and how I cook now and my demographic. Right, right. That makes sense. You you figure out your audience, who your audience is, and that doesn't really fit anymore. So that makes sense. Now, do you have other people helping you create things at this point or do you do more, still do the bulk of it yourself? I do a lot of it myself. I do have people help especially as, you know, this year, my husband and I traveled more. My Mm -hmm. oldest daughter moved in with us because she has brain cancer. And so there's taking her, you know, we have to take her to chemo. And so there was really no way that I could put in the kind of hours that I used to put in, but I I still do a lot of it. That's good. I'm so sorry you're going through that. Yeah. Well, you know, it life, right? It's life. life. It is life, unfortunately. Yeah. You can either be negative about it or you can be positive about it. Right. At least you're able to take her in and she has a place to go where you can help her out, you know, like not everybody has that even. So, right. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's been blessing in it too, even though that sounds weird, but I like to look, I like to look at the positive sides of things. I've rarely been through anything 
that I can look back on and say, oh, that was terrible because there's always been something that came out of it that was good. So, and she's that. really, she's doing great. So there's that. That's good. That's awesome. But you're right there. Are, you, I don't think that even if it's something small, you're still going to learn something, right? Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Oh, I agree. Yeah. So tell me about, I was perusing your website a little bit and I, it's kind of fun for me to look at your section where it said, tell me about, so tell me about your amazing ingredient substitution ideas. And like, this has happened to me before where I'm like, oh, the buttermilk went bad or, oh, I don't have as much sugar as I thought. What are some, how did you figure out these things for substitutions? Did you read up or did you just try it out? Most of them came out of the really old cookbooks because those people had a lot of smarts, right? Um, Yes. For example, one of my cookbooks from, oh, 1850, 1860, there was a little note in it, put a pinch of ginger in the yeast water when you're making bread. And so I did, I did that. And pretty much now everybody is doing that because it's such a great activator, but Mm -hmm. I think it started with me because it was 2009, but, but yeah, so I never really would have thought about that, but some of those old things that they used to do really make sense. So a pinch of ginger in with yeast and sugar and water really helps activate it really, really well. So I learned those things from, from the cook, you know, cookbooks like that. And like the depression era and world war two, world war two era cookbooks where they had to cook with rations, you know, they had ration cards and all of that. Um, They had a lot of ways of doing things. And some of those recipes we still use today. Like I think there's one called a crazy cake or something like that. It doesn't like water and oil and nothing. I don't know. (laughs) I couldn't think what all was in it, but anyway, so, so as generations have gone through things, they've learned how to get around their problems, right? What they, what they don't have. And so I learned about the ginger thing. I learned uh, about how you can take baking soda and, um, I lost it in my head, the, you can, <laughs> the cream of tartar and oh, yes. that together and make baking powder, basically. Mm-hmm. And, so, you know, once you start understanding and then you start looking at it, you go, wait, this is chemistry. And right. Right. So, but I use a lot of those old things. And so when I wrote, actually that just published today. Oh, it did. Are you serious? Maybe yeah. that's why it was that maybe, maybe as I saw it because it was right there, it you know, right the front. Yeah. But so, <laughs> well, I haven't written down all of them, but I think I've got like 50 on there, but oh, um, wow. Yeah. So like you can use molasses, you can you mix a tablespoon of molasses in with like a cup of brown sugar and have like or a cup of white sugar and have a light brown sugar. Same flavor. You can add a tablespoon of cornstarch might be a teaspoon anyway to of cornstarch to sugar and blend it up in your blender you're going to have powdered sugar it's come in handy numerous times oh yeah I could bet yeah yeah so and you can use sour cream for buttermilk you can use greek yogurt for buttermilk you can you know mm. and I really like to culture my own buttermilk so I mm. I just I can get it as rich and as thick as I want. A lot of times the buttermilk from the store is skim and I don't skim milk. So Mm -hmm. I'll get whole milk and put a little bit of, of the store-bought buttermilk in there, but you can also get cultures on Amazon and then you just let it sit and it creates a whole thing of buttermilk, you know, the way you want it. Yeah. So I mean, and when you talk about that, think about how it was back then that they couldn't just go to the store. And now we have all these amazing delivery things because of COVID all these people are delivering grocery stores. All I need to do is call or order online and poof, it appears at our door. And they did not have anything remotely like that. You know, they had to travel. They had to travel. You know, it's (laughs) crazy. I love, I love the delivery thing. I mean, I went to the gym Mm -hmm. with my son this morning. We left here at about 20 after five and Mm -hmm. went down to the gym. And when we got home, all of my groceries were sitting on my front ready to come in. It was like, huh. It's such a time saver, but yeah, think about how different that is. So, but, but those things come in handy too, because we do run out of things, even though it's still convenient to get things, 
you know, sometimes you'll be making something and something went bad and you're like, oh, you know, you still want to make it. So those, those substitutions really come in healthy, (laughs) healthy, come in very helping. One thing that made me think of, and I don't know if this, it's probably a common one too, but putting a piece of bread in brown sugar when it's hard, that's what something I learned from my mom and my grandma when I was younger. That's not really a substitution, but that's like a fix. And I was telling my son that when we were making some cookies and he he said, oh, it's all hard. I said, well, let's just put a piece of bread in there and then we'll be able to use it. And he's like, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was was fun to teach him that. (laughs) That's the kind of information that used to get passed down. It's not passed down anymore. Right. Exactly. Yes. I mean, and it is weird. I don't even know why that works, but yeah, you're right. It's chemistry and it's biology and it's all those things. That Yeah. A lot of our science classes happened in the kitchen when we were home. A lot <laughs> oh, of I them. bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The kids love to play in the kitchen. They really do just to make things and just play and with stuff. There, usually if they're involved with it, they they're better about eating different things too. Yes. That's so true. If they had a hand in making it like, oh, maybe I'll try this. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I'll try one bite. My son still, my youngest one still has issues. Like he doesn't love beans. So like when we have chili, he's, oh, it has beans in it. You know, like he doesn't love the beans, but he's getting better. He eats most things. It's so funny how they go through different phases in life and how we were talking earlier, how it impacts your cooking in, yeah, having the number of kids home. You know, it's constantly changing how we cook. It is. It is. And I was a super picky eater when I was little. I would only mm-hmm. I would only eat spaghetti with butter and parmesan on it. And oh, I yeah. would, I would eat salad and Brussels sprouts, oddly enough. And, oh wow. And bananas. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> sounds sounds pretty familiar. A lot of kids go through that where they're just like just a little little grouping of foods they're willing to eat. Yeah, and tiny bit. And hopefully they'll all grow that. I think most kids most people do outgrow that and so. start to eat more things. So <laughs> we shouldn't really parents tend to freak out about that kind of stuff though. And we really yeah. shouldn't. I I think my pediatrician, when my mom asked him, said, Don't worry about it. She'll eat when she's hungry. <laughs> Excuse that's me. good. That's good advice. That's what everybody needs. I think because some people get so hyper about it. Like, you know, you have to eat this much broccoli and this much blah, blah. My kids wouldn't touch broccoli. They still don't love it, but I never forced them to eat broccoli. They tried it, but I never was one of those parents who were like, you have to eat the broccoli. You know, like it just wasn't me. It's not worth it. It isn't at all. So were any of your kids vegetarian or have they all been meat eaters? Actually, I am pretty much vegetarian. Oh, and you are too. Okay. So several of the kids are. And then, so we kind of have it split down the middle. We have the vegetarian leaning side over here and uh-huh. we have the not vegetarian leaning side over here. So yeah, we're pretty well split up. So you we kind of have actually, to do what I do. When the kids were really small, I didn't, I think I only had two or three. We were actually vegan for about mm. three or four years. So, okay. It'd, it'd be tough to be vegan. I think, I mean, I think I could do it being a vegetarian, but I, I like to have the dairy in there. It just, yeah. Like cheese. <laughs> yes. That was what, that's what brought me back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you have the whole challenge of making a meal and making everybody happy too, which is why I constantly have dealt with myself. Yeah. I, don't try to make everybody happy. I make whatever I'm putting on the blog and they can or <laughs> not. I mean, they're all adults. Right. They, can, they can go to, you know, Burger King or Whataburger or whatever. Exactly. So true. And, and it's, it's not as hard as people think though, if you're trying to make things or fitting to feeding two different types of diets, people are always like, I think it's such a big deal. Oh, what are you going to eat? What are you going to make? That sounds really hard. It's really not. You just have to be very mindful how you do it. Yes. My mom lived with us for the last year or so of her life, and she was on a very strict diet for her heart, which is actually pretty silly, but that's that's a whole nother story. And then I was pregnant, and I was on a very careful diet because I tend to have high blood sugar when I was pregnant, Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And then there was the family. So I... (laughs) <laughs> it can be done. You can you can cook three or four different ways. It's not that hard. 
Right. I mean, if you take things out before you meet in other portions, you just have to split things up at the right time. Just be really mindful. That's kind of how I always think of it. Just to be really mindful what you're doing and kind of plan it ahead. Pay attention where you put meat, where you don't put meat. Because I had a few recipes that I've put out and some people that were vegetarians totally balked at me saying, well, how can you put meat in the same dish when you're eating it meatless? I said, you just put it on one side. And they're like, no, no, you can't do that. Like they thought it was all like taboo. And I'm like, I've done it many times and it doesn't drift. If you do it right and you have the right recipe, the meat's not going to drift over there. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, people, some people are purists and they're like, nope, nope, I'm not doing that. That's not even right. (laughs) To each their own. So what have you run into? Have you run into people that were, you know, cutting you down? Do you get people that are naysayers? And what do you say to them or just ignore them? How do you deal with people who are negative towards you or do you not experience that? Negative towards me about like saying things like maybe bad reviews or saying they don't like your recipes, those kind of people. <laughs> those people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yes, I do get those. Most of the time, I try to be nice because I do think of myself as being a very nice person. Sometimes it really hurts. I mean, I have more than once cried over something that somebody mm-hmm. wrote. Yeah. Wrote. But the funniest one was somebody, I have a copycat Cracker Barrel hamburger steaks, right? With onion gravy, really popular recipe on the blog. And one person came on and said that they they gave the recipe a one-star rating. And she said, Mm. I hate this recipe because I went to Cracker Barrel two weeks ago and I got food poisoning from this very dish. And I was like, oh, geez. I don't really think food poisoning is one of the ingredients, but you know, oh, wow, you know, some people are weird. They are weird, but that just made me laugh because it was just so over the top and funny. And I go ahead and publish those. I mean, I don't care. People can right. think, stink. but you're always going to, you know, you're always going to have people that like, I have a couple of recipes. Some people have really good luck with it. It's amazing. They love it. They just go crazy over it. They leave beautiful reviews. and then. Yep whole nother batch of people on that same recipe that'll be like this recipe (laughs) didn't work it didn't set up it didn't do this and I'm like I don't understand how that happens but it does it does and it's out of your control it could be bad ingredients but then often people will yeah they'll blame the recipe and be like oh no it's the recipe there's like so many other reasons why that could have happened yep but yeah we went to Thanksgiving with I had a pecan pie recipe go viral and Mm -hmm. I got a lot of comments. This pie didn't set up. It's it's goopy all over the, you know, it's like running all over the place. It's running right out of the crust. And I said, um, did you refrigerate it overnight? Like it says to in the recipe? <laughs> no, I was in a hurry. Jeez. What are you going to do? That's, it's so annoying though. when people would leave a, a negative review for that. And it's something that they just didn't even follow directions for. So it like reflects negatively on you when there's no reason it should. They did it. I don't think it, I don't think it reflects negatively on me. I I don't think most people really, really look at those reviews. I mean, maybe they do, but I think most people are responsible enough to read the reviews and see, well, okay, 80% of the reviews are really good. And there's just this 20% over here. That's really bad. And I'm guessing that the 80%, you know, I mean, if you have like 100% bad reviews or something, all right. that's another thing. That's true. That's true. And so you do have to, we all know that because we know people that are super picky or ridiculous. So we kind of have to expect that. And as a person who's creating content, you have to accept that you're going to get those people that are going to come at you. If you're putting something out in the world, yeah. you're going to get those people. Like my worst one was somebody gave me a one star because they said they didn't order my book. And I'm like, what? Why would you give me a one star and leave a review that you didn't order my book? I'm like, I don't even understand that. What do you mean? Yeah. I'm like, not going to be everybody's cup of coffee, you know? (laughs) Some people are just not going to be your people. That's right. That's right. But you do need to have a thick skin. Do you, do you, when you find, you said you coach people, do you, do you bring that kind of stuff up with people when you're coaching? Most of the time with the people I'm coaching, we're working on growing their blogs. Okay. So, but we do talk about that a lot and, you know, it's your blog. It's like your house. So if somebody comes into your house and they're super rude, if you want to toss them out on their backside, you have every right to toss them out on their backside. Just because somebody leaves a comment on your blog doesn't mean that you have to publish it. 
Right. That's so true. And don't take it to heart. Just Or have, you know, have like one of your kids or your husband or your best friend, give them your, um, you know, give them access to your blog and just give them the job of going through the comments and answering them and, and deleting all of the nasty stuff. That way you never have to see it. That's true. That's a, that's a definitely a good way to do it, to just get it out of there. So you don't even see it. Yes. That's that's not going to help you. You just need to, if you can't, if you can't shed it and just let it bounce off of you, that's a great way to deal with it. Yep. So where do you see yourself going in the future? Do you have things in the works or plans or what's your Um, future plan? I am working on my YouTube channel and Mm, trying to get that going. I really enjoy doing YouTube. This year, I haven't gotten as much done as I usually do just because again, the travel and my daughter being sick and stuff, but I'm going to get back to that hopefully soon. But I love doing that. And I never thought I would love being on camera like that, but it was just fun. And I like getting the emails and stuff and people like me. And that's always a shock to me. (laughs) It's like, oh, wow, (laughs) you like me. So so there's that. Really, I don't don't think anything is going to change a whole, whole lot. I mean, my blog Mm -hmm. is quite large and I'd like to continue to grow it. I've considered... Mm -hmm. I did start a bread blog for a while, but I can't keep up Mm. with it. So I'm going to pull all of the recipes over to my regular blog and shut that one down. Um, It's just too much. But um, so maybe at some point I'll start another blog, but I don't think so. I'm thinking about writing fiction next. Oh, nice. So there's that. So what would you write? What what kind of genre would you write? I would would write probably uh, fantasy fiction. Oh, nice. That's very yeah. cool. Now, would you do it in the future or set in the past or current times? Have you thought that far ahead? <laughs> mm, probably, probably different. Well, probably current times, probably current times and just to have yeah. something strange about it, you know, but. Oh yeah. Oh, that's very cool. I hope you but, do. That's another adventure for you. Yeah. I always wanted to write a, I always wanted to write a book. So that would be fun. That's very cool. Now, when you coach people, do you do it as an organized thing or you just kind of do it for people here and there? Or do you have like an, because some people have like, you know, organized courses or classes where they coach people. I used to have courses, but, and they were SEO, but SEO changes so much and so fast. I found that taking an SEO course is not the best way to learn it. So I was coaching people by myself and then One of my first coaching clients who has become my accountability partner and very dear friend is now co-coaching with me. So we're both coaching. We take a very limited number of people and then, yeah. And, and it's just basically helping them figure out where their weaknesses are in their blog and where their strengths Mm -hmm. are, how to play off their strengths and kind of, yeah. Very cool. Now, I didn't examine every spot of your your blog, your website. Do you have you have strictly all food, or do you go into any other areas of family life, or is it basically all recipes and food? It's mostly recipes and food. There's a few posts on there about the travel that we've done, yeah. just pictures and stuff. But it's like it's very casual. It's not like a travel blog or even oh, okay travel blog post. It's just like this is where we went. You know, just like you would show your friends pictures because yeah. you know, like my readers on my blog, I'm very close to a lot of them. And so it's a very, it's, they're very special and I want to share things with them. Right. And it's giving you more information or giving them more information about you and kind of just like bonding and yeah, yeah just sharing and, and showing more of who you are. Yeah. That's really cool. Very cool. That's awesome. So what's your recipe you're working on right now? Do you have a specific one? Right now I'm doing a lot of updates and Mm. reshooting old stuff. So okay, sure. um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to move towards Thanksgiving stuff. And I'm looking to find the holes that, that I've left. Like Mm. if you have a Southern food blog, there's certain things you should have on your blog. You should have collard greens, you should have grits, you should have, (laughs) Yep, yep. so I'm trying to fill those holes. So one of the next things that's going to go on there is I want a 30 minute version of chicken and waffles. Mm, So that's what I'm working on right now. It was so funny that 
Reminds me of something my son recently, we were ordering food and there was chicken and waffles and my entire family had never heard of chicken and waffles besides me. And I'm like, how have you guys not heard of this? I guess it's because we're from the North, but I'm like, maybe I've heard of it because I've, you know, been a food yeah. blogger or blog about food. I'm like, that's a thing. And they're like, that's a thing. And I'm like, you it is. <laughs> yep. it's kind of funny that they didn't know. So I have to ask being a food blogger, do you do Pinterest? I do Pinterest. I have yeah. always really loved Pinterest and me too. Pinterest has always been really good to me. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I do it as much as I did five years ago when Pinterest was okay. at its height, but, right. um, but I still do it on a regular basis. So your main one you're kind of focusing on these days is more YouTube? Um, or do you have other platforms you use frequently? Usually Pinterest and Facebook is, you know, oh, okay. that's where I spend a lot of time when I'm not on my blog. YouTube definitely spend a lot of time there. But like I said, this year, it's probably not in the upper levels of where I'm at because of mm-hmm. so much going on. But I like to, I like to think of blogging as kind of a table with four legs or three legs either way like a three-legged milking school stool. I prefer a four-legged table. So I like to have my, I like to have the Google traffic. I like to have Pinterest traffic. I like to have Facebook traffic. And then I like to have some kind of book or digital product or something, YouTube, something that's going to, you know, balance that out because you can, over the past year, I lost 70, 68, 68 or 70% of my Facebook traffic, which was really significant and really down. But most of my traffic, it was pretty evenly spaced between Google's my number one, and then Pinterest is my number two or three, depending on where Facebook is. And then Facebook comes in here like this. So we can lose 68% of one of those. um, That's, that's a significant amount. I mean, it, is a significant amount. It hits you financially, but yes. you're just losing the one because you still have the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Right. So yes, yes, yes. So that, that's why I, that's my, always my advice to anybody. If they are doing anything, whether it's blogging or any kind of entrepreneur where they're responsible for their own income, they're not working mm-hmm. for somebody else then they need to make sure that they have several different streams of income coming from several different places so that if one gets kicked out from under you, you're not going to suffer for it. It'll be like, oh, dang, I can't get that new couch I wanted to get. Shoot. But but it's not going to keep you from being able to feed your kids or anything like that. Absolutely. And, you know, that's just the thing, too. We don't own these platforms. They can change their algorithms. You know, for me, my biggest ones are Pinterest and Google as well, but my Facebook has been horrible for me, but kind of quit working on it because it became horrible. And I'm like, I just kept backing away because I'm like doing effort here and there's nothing coming back. So why yeah. am I bothering? Right. I usually suggest to people that they put the most time in where their money is coming from mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, kind of break it up that way. But I put a lot of time into Facebook only because I did really well on it before and because I love a challenge and I want to figure out what (laughs) happened and how I can fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get it. So do you, do you dream about recipes? (laughs) Do you wake up in the morning? You're like, Oh, I want to try this. Or how do you get your new inspirations? Usually from the old cookbooks, I'll be, you know, I read those old cookbooks a lot and I'll see something. Uh, Well, there was one I did. I don't think it's up on the blog yet. But it's called Dixie Chicken. And I was like, well, so I wanted to see if it was anywhere else on the internet. And so I looked all over the place. And there is a recipe called that, but it's not the recipe that I've got. And this was from like a 1940s cookbook. And I was like, that's interesting. So so I've made that and I adapted it from what it was and made it a slow cooker recipe. It should be out in the next well, I'll probably do it in August because it's more of a back to school recipe, uh-huh. but, um, but it is really creamy comfort food and it's really easy. And, um, and so I get a lot of that where, you know, the older recipes, one of the recipes I did from one of the old cookbooks, and this was a 1930s cookbook was chicken pot pie with 
mashed sweet potatoes on top instead of oh. and that was very it's really good and it's really different um yeah so that's usually where I get inspiration from I like that. I like that you dive into those old cookbooks and, you know, I've done some of that myself too. It's really fun. Like you said, you'll, you see different types of recipes, different types of food combinations that are just different because they're from so long ago. Yeah. It seems like sometimes food blogs, especially when you get in the higher traffic ones, sometimes it feels like everybody does the same thing. And to a yeah. certain extent, that's, you know, to a certain extent, you have to do that because those are the recipes that people are looking for. And that's how sure. you're going to make a living. And that's what we all want to do is make a living. Yep. But it, and it's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of story, JC Penny and Sears, oh. Macy's and Bloomingdale's, all of them kind of had the same thing. They present yep. it in different ways. So right. that's how I see it, but it's still nice to go into a boutique store once in a while mm -hmm. and something that's nobody else has. Yes. So as long as there's balance, it's not a problem. Right. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, this has been so amazing. Is there anything that we haven't talked about or that you'd like to mention before we end our chat? I don't think so. It's been really fun though. It was. I really enjoyed getting to know you. This was really fun. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming on. I really enjoyed it. And I'll put all of your links down in the podcast show notes so people can find where you are and so thank you so much. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.